What happens when you take a green ogre, his sidekick donkey, the princess he loves, and other assorted fairy tale creatures off the screen and put them onto the stage? You have Shrek the Musical. Hello, I'm Melissa Rose Bernardo, and joining me today to tell us how they all got to Broadway is the creative team behind Shrek. David Lindsay Abair, who wrote the book and lyrics, producer Bill Demashke, director Jason Moore, producer Caro Newling, and Janine Tesori, who wrote the music. So whose idea was it to bring Shrek to Broadway? Caro, do you want to take that one? Yeah. Um, it was uh, uh, Sam Mendes' idea, and uh, he'd just been working with DreamWorks, making a couple of movies, and uh, had uh, become friends with Jeffrey Katzenberg, who runs DreamWorks Animation. And uh, it struck him, uh, it was after the first of the Shrek movies came out, so this was way before the uh, subsequent movies appeared. So it was very much based on the first movie, and it struck him straight away that this was the makings. It had all the hallmarks of m great storytelling, um, and it was a golden opportunity, so he suggested it to Jeffrey, and Bill took it from there. Well, take us a little bit through the development process. It's been five years? In the making? <laughs> 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 yeah, it's been yes, five yes. years. Five years in, the in musical <laughs> development, it's like dog years. It's like 35 years. Yeah. I think <laughs> oh. It hasn't been that this team has been working on this show for five years. This team has actually worked incredibly quickly. So it would be misleading to say that the people around this table have been together for five years because we were a good year rolling around what the story was and sort of creating a, a, a very basic, very basic list of initial thoughts about who might be great to work on the show. So I guess it was probably um, at least a year doing that. And then there was a second year talking to people, getting their responses to the original source material, seeing who might be the right fit. So it was, I guess, two years to, to, to arrive at the point <coughs> where this team were mm -hmm. actually working on the show. Mm -hmm. And David came on. David came onto the project first. You have a. I think you said you have a, your very first contract is dated two thousand and two or something I think like that's that. Right. Yeah. So you you came on first, and and we talked about. We talked. To, I mean, first, uh, Sam and Carol had produced my play Footy Mirrors in the West End, so that's how I knew them. When I was first approached, um, we didn't know whether we were going to adapt the first movie or actually do an original musical using the characters from Shrek, and so we bandied that around for several months, Sam and I meeting in a diner and talking about, is it this, is it that? And finally, uh, everybody came to their senses and said, <laughs> you know what, why don't we just do the first movie? It's such a solid story and the characters are so well established. Let's start there. Um, and that's when other members of the team started to come on board. How did you know Janine's work and Jason's work? Well, I, I go to the theater <laughs> and, and, and uh, I, I, I work in the animation division, so prior to this side, hobby job of working <laughs> in the Broadway show I um, had been working on the animated films but um, have a background in theater before that and so uh, at that point I was mostly just fans of their work and uh, and had known of them really for many many years before then in particular Jason and I had known each other for a long time um, Jason came on the project next mm -hmm. really because that was the next big step that we took in terms of the development once we secured the idea that we were going to base it on the first film but borrow, borrow liberally from both the book and any other things that we wanted to bring into it to make it a pure theatrical event um, Jason come, came on board and we started having talks about the the way we would have music function in the show. We had crazy ideas, like let's have all kinds of different composers and <laughs> let's have 17 people write songs and <laughs> we'll have somebody just you know, weave it all together somehow. And those are all, you know, in a moment that would seem like great ideas. But I, again, another come to our senses <laughs> moments senses, was yeah. um, we, we need someone who is a composer for the theater, who writes themes, who writes for characters, and who knows how to weave those things together throughout an entire story so that you arrive at the end and you have the, the experience of, of music and, and, um, and composition that helps to tell the story on top of the words and everything else that, that brings you there. So I remember quite clearly that we had um, a Janine Tesori-like 
you know, mixtape that we had made for ourselves over a, a Thanksgiving so or a Christmas. So you a lot of clubs, yeah. that mixtape. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> a bass drum and you're off and running. <laughs> That's a lot, lot, yeah. lot of life dance. Really. <laughs> <laughs> this was kind of like a real transatlantic <laughs> operation at that point because Bill was based at uh, uh, the DreamWorks Animation Campus in Glendale and uh, Neil Street Productions where it had its main office in London. Um, and we had this fantastic sort of few months of putting together ideas and and playing with samples and then we were quietly excited about Janine all along that's the honest truth of it that that really is the honest truth of it but there was this fantastic moment where we put this sample of Janine's work which was sort of you know a complete you know riches with um, Mulan thrown in as well. I mm -hmm. remember that, and of course, Carol Carol James, James, Violet, Millie, 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 all these songs. And, uh, and, and there was a moment, wasn't there, when you put lady. you put uh, in front of Jeffrey, and of course Sam was very familiar. But there were these kind of transatlantic conversations going on all the time. And I remember that you phoned me, and I was sitting on a train going into London, and you phoned and said it's going to be Janine. And I remember standing up in the train and going, yay, <laughs> kind of thing, and all these people looking around. But it was a really exciting moment. It was a real, like, this is going to be it. Meanwhile, so, there I was, where in my world, thinking, God, help the composer who takes that project on. <laughs> <laughs> That's going to be a hard one. So you didn't want it at all. <laughs> I wanted to do it very much, but you know, the movie is, the movie's beautiful. What? What are you doing in my swamp? And it has a great heart. And the, the score to it, the orchestral score as well as the songs that were chosen. And I, you know, I've done a, a lot of um, animated movies, especially a lot of DVDs. And you know, the way that, that songs get chosen, sometimes there's, the stories themselves are very funny. And often one person feels very strongly and it goes in, or there's some song that you find or one song that you write. and it's. Anim animated movies are, are put together very much like musicals. They, they're really kissing cousins. You know, there's a long development and a lot of people trying to make one moment happen. And, uh, and so I, th I think that the development process by which Bill and Sam and Jeffrey shepherded this project, they, they really, it was a continuation of what they were used to doing. And so it, 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 there, it wasn't a, a stretch, it was just taking a, of the, the composition on comparing it to what had come before was, was, it was, I have to say, a little bit tricky. How do you decide what stays and what goes? I mean, do you say, okay, we're going to keep this line word for word, we have to retain this particular moment? How do you make those decisions? I think the first big decisions about what was staying or going, there was nothing there because there was no music yet. Mm -hmm. And so it's, since it's a musical, we had to start there. And that was you know, getting them to write songs together for the first time because this is a first collaboration for them because Janine works with many lyricists. That's one of the reasons I think we were, I was so excited about having her as part of it because David had been working on the show for a while and so understood the tone and had done you know, even written lyric ideas and song titles so that he was already thinking that way. So it seemed a really natural match for the two of them to work together. But I think it was first to figure out which, which moments are worth musicalizing in the basic story and then what themes emerge from there. Because there was, there wasn't deciding that at the beginning. It was just about creating, you know, a sort of bank of songs to start to feel what the show was going to be. And, and Jeffrey, I would say the one, the one, uh, instruction that he gave to everybody was don't just put the movie on stage. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Whatever you do, don't just make a Xerox of the movie and put it on stage. If you do that, we shouldn't do it. Mm -hmm. We should only do it if it's original and, and interesting and, and, and takes the characters and the situations that people are familiar with and gives them enough of that but then expands those characters and expands the world. And I think that was, you know, Brilliant guidance, and probably the only way that you guys would have wanted to work on the show is if right. that was had been the you know the brief. But that was really, I think, his his one brief, and and Sam echoed that brief, and I think that you know. Yeah, I think that's true. It's also you know, their quest musicals are very difficult, I and mean, we think about the Iliad and the Odyssey, and there are very few of them. I mean, West Side Story and Gypsy and Carousel, they don't travel. They're not. There's no road to Rio musical. Home Sweet Homer was not particularly successful, although it was a really great piece, strangely enough. You know, Mena La Mancha is still set in um, a jail and then travels from there. But when you really think about great stories, they're, they're, it's cinematic in its scope. So one of the things that 
we had to do is really break down how is this going to travel and how is the travel metaphor. So when the characters go across the bridge, they, they're not just going across the bridge because theater works best in metaphor. They're really going across to become friends at the end. So it's never going to compete with the spectacle of that. You're going to invest in the mechanics and in the steel and the song the way that those two travel. So that's what we tried to do. And with you know, that, what Bill just said about Jeffries was really important because it wasn't just said at the beginning. It was said all the way through. Mm -hmm. Guys, forget the movie. Forget the movie here. What do you want to bring in it? Like We know these characters better than anyone, and they do. But what, what are we doing that we couldn't do in the movie? What, what can the proscenium do? And it was a constant, had to be re reminded, because I was afraid you know, to, to travel too far, in a sense. In a way, you guys started there, too, because you wrote the Dragon Song first, yeah. and then Fiona's backstory. So those two were so exciting that that was the, the proof that, you know what, let's keep going in the way of what, are, what is the movie not telling us, or the book not telling us? What can we find about the emotional life of the characters? And, those worked so, you know, worked so well. It was like, keep doing more of that. Yeah. Yeah, we started with, with <coughs> character and story first. We, had, we didn't jump into a thing, let's dismantle this thing, because mm -hmm. clearly the story and the characters work. But one of the questions that we did ask is, what don't we know about the characters? What, what didn't the movie tell us? And so the princess song in particular, you know, Janine and I were sort of trying to figure out how we worked together, because I had never done lyrics and we had never worked before. And so, you know, that's one example we said. Uh, a Cleveland and a Pulitzer Prize later. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks to Janine helping me. Oh. <laughs> uh, what don't we know about Fiona? What's she doing in that tower all day? She's been there for 20 years. When did she get there? That's right. We had a, her like uh, with a scarf that went really. We wore her hat on all an elliptical made of wood at one point. We were like, <laughs> many, <laughs> went in many directions. <laughs> yes, we did. Um, but that was, you know, that's one place to start. What don't we know and how best to tell this story and how did this character end up being that character? And Shrek too, you know, when the movie starts, we see him and he's on his swamp and he's already the ogre that we know. We said, okay, well, what don't we know about Shrek? How did he get there exactly? And the answer that we found uh, was actually on the first couple pages of the Steig book where we see the parents kicking him out and how he became the ogre that we know. Um, but we also had access to the reels that they put up when they were doing the movie, yeah. which I appreciated because that's that's you know that's usually in your sock drawer and you put it away. And they they gave us everything, the notes at all the meetings. And sometimes you have to go down those routes that they went down, that Aaron and all of you went down, and then discovered, oh, let's go over here. But then when we were going through an idea, it was a similar process that you had to go through to go. The reels that they first reel they put up, they did this. Why did they change it? Why did they not continue? Because you had the parents mm -hmm. as well, which we didn't find out until mm -hmm. I think after we had the idea. So somehow there was some storytelling and parenting, and there's a lot of uh, things in fairy tales about towers and moats and how, what they symbolize. And so you put that kind of structure or obstacles, and and then you know with some farts and burps and <laughs> mix it all together. But the process had been going on for literally three and a half years. What should we keep? What shouldn't we keep? And that was just about putting it in front of each other, putting it in front of workshop audiences, and then, you know, of course, Seattle, and now here in New York. Um, and not until that last ingredient is in the mix do you know what to keep or what to throw out, frankly. And there are still some things you pretty much know you have to keep, like Shrek's look, for example. Mm -hmm. He has to look like Shrek. Otherwise, if he walks out there, all the kids are going to go, huh? Who's mm -hmm. that? Right, I would imagine that was one had, thing. We knew he had to be green, we knew he had to have horns, and sort of beyond that we weren't sure, we knew he had to have a lot of heart, and that was gonna be from the actor coming underneath. But we did lots of tests along the way, because one of the reasons we also brought in um, designers early on at, as part of the process was knowing that, especially because they, like the first Dragon Song was written to be played by multiple women, and the Fiona was gonna be played by a young and a middle, and an older Fiona, that there was a sort of theatrical conceit to the songs that they were writing. So it became clear that we were going to look for some design elements early on, and sure, we knew we wanted to start with Shrek. So getting, his, getting kids to have access, and everyone have access to that character, and then listen to them sing on top of it, I think was the, the thing we were trying to make seamless so people could listen to the music for the first time. And hopefully. I mean, the thing that we always talked about, too, is to not depend on the technology so that it, it, when, whenever from now that a, a middle school can put yeah. this on, stick some ears on, and as long as people behave, I mean theater to me is about behavior, as long as people behave that he's another, 
or she's another. I mean, you know, however a fifth grade teacher can do it, and in this country it's really difficult because it's usually gym teachers or English teachers or it's anybody who, who can do that. That, that. The story holds because mm -hmm. it's a classic. It's a beautiful story, really well told in the movie and in the book. And so that not depending on, you know, we have this advanced technology that is extraordinary in the show, but I, I believe in my heart it's not dependent on that because Absolutely. of the very, the heart and the soul and the adventure, the humor of the piece itself is intact. Did his, did Shrek's look, for example, evolve? Like, did you try a lot of different things, costume-wise, makeup-wise, to get to... We tried, we tried different versions in this, for this production. We tried uh, different versions of, you know, more or less, you know, for him, but, but getting him to be big and imposing was also part of it, not just the way he looked, but his size, because the story is, is that he's an other. He doesn't look like everybody else. He's fearsome. People, people run from him. They're scared of him. They feel like he might eat their children or whatever. So kind of getting that to land was part of what we were trying to do physically, but ultimately, we came around to wanting to see Shrek, but also to see our fantastic actor underneath it. Of course I'd be a hero, and I would scale a tower to save a hothouse flower and carry her away. But standing guard would be a beast. I'd somehow overwhelm it. I'd get the girl, I'd take a breath, and I'd remove my helmet. But as Janine said, that, that high school test was something I always I really learned from you, which is it has to work, though, without all of those things. And then maybe those things are happy dressing or exciting to look at. Yeah. But essentially, the story is, is intact no matter what you put on its Well, face. I taught middle school. And yeah. that is, <laughs> it's, that was, you know, I taught, I was at Barnard, and I would go up to Riverdale and teach middle school. And it was constantly like, how are we going to do this? Because mm -hmm. In, for, for me, one of the things that I, again, this is a DreamWorks philosophy, I think, is it's not just about New York. It's, it's an American piece. And therefore, at some point, we want it to go out into American, to be done by kids, to be done by teachers, so that they can be performed. It's not, it's to go out into the, to the world. And, and that becomes, it's, it's, it's such an important thing to be part of the canon. Otherwise, if it depends on bungee cord, all of that stuff, which is great, you, you can't do it when you have a dollar ninety-five and your you know a twenty-four-year-old drama teacher doesn't know what. Well, I, I knew half what I was doing, but not much more than that. <laughs> and so it's it's just if we, I I try to aim as much as I can, you know, in pieces like that to to think like that, and that's how DreamWorks believes. You know, it's their philosophy as well. I think on the on the Shrek also. I think even in from a process. In the early days, in looking for an actor to play Shrek, you know, our our caught casting calls that were, went out were like, must be six foot eight and weigh four hundred <laughs> pounds. Like we really, we actually were looking for Shrek. We were mm -hmm. looking for somebody who, perhaps with very little makeup and very little costuming, mm -hmm. was Shrek. And I think that um, in the true. journey of that pursuit. What we came to discover, and it came both in the script and in the writing around the same time, was that who Shrek is in the inside is who we needed to cast as our actor. And, and, and that's what makes it such a universal story and something that's so relatable to, because I think that you know, Shrek, Shrek sees himself one way, the world sees him another way. And I think that you know, we can let the costuming and the prosthetics and the makeup actually do the job for the actor. <clears throat> and ultimately, what has to come through is that guy who wants to be loved and for people to see him for who he really is and who, you know, dreamed one day that he might be a hero and, and actually is living a story where he becomes a hero. And I think that is when you, you it was like, oh, wow, yes, we can have an actor who's five foot eight and who's a leading man and who just is a great actor and a great singer who brings all that heart to the role and comedy and, and emotion. And that's, that was a big I think that was one of our big process changes as yeah, well. Yeah, absolutely. I remember Sam said that. He, he said it, it would be like casting Falstaff. I remember the day that he said that, remember? And yes, absolutely. And there was another major day as well when talking about makeup and stripping away and the importance of actually the actor animating the character was the day we had that great big donkey head. Do you mm -hmm. remember? We had this great big Yikes. donkey yeah. head, and it had moving <laughs> ears and swiveling eyes Too and joy. Much. And the, the actor was completely buried underneath, and a lot of skill had gone into making it. It was a very beautiful thing. But Sam very quietly got up, walked over, and took it off and set it aside. And actually, as you see now in the production, Daniel Breaker, who plays donkey absolutely brilliantly, he has a little bit of a white strip on his nose 
and there's no other covering because we need to see him. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. So where's that donkey head now? It's an Equus, actually. <laughs> <Stop>. <laughs> Bill's wearing it for opening night. <laughs> <laughs> opening night gifts everywhere and Halloween things. We have Halloween costumes for <laughs> years. <laughs> oh, gosh. Um, well, one thing that really um, surprised me about the show is there's a lot of adult humor in there, and uh, which which I thought was was great. I, but I, references to you know, Ang and Chang and a, a, <laughs> a Judy Bloom joke, which uh -huh. I love, and the eight-year-old behind me was like, uh. <laughs> but I, I think that's great. Was that a conscious decision on your part to say we've got to appeal to the adults as well? We can't just make this straight up kitty stuff. Well, I will I will say it's one of the things that I love most about both the book and the film, and why as a dad I could sit through Shrek hundreds of times because. There's so much adult humor in it, and of course it appeals to the kids, but um, hopefully it appeals to the grown-ups as well. And it's why I said yes to the project, frankly, because I thought, look, this stuff is irreverent and tonally up my alley, and I was going to make sure that that was still in there, and of course it was exactly what DreamWorks wanted. So yes, there's a lot of adult humor. Well, also, we're, I think that we're very immature, so I think that... <laughs> True no, that. I mean, like, that you know, if someone true. trips on the street, <laughs> yeah. David and I just erupt in laughter. Usually it's one of us. I do not. That's a lie. <laughs> That's uh, lowbrow. But I think, you know, you, it, I think in the sense of play, like, when we, we were all at one of the early previews and we were sitting there like this, and one kid in the middle um, the orchestra was the laughter was whole, just one kid. Just like, cut through the cut audience. Cut through everything else. And, you know, there were a lot of older people, and it was just the <laughs> looking at the each other. Scene, yeah. Because to get the, a kid to laugh and the parent to understand the references, oh, Ang and Chang and the Judy Bloom, I remember that book, so they can have an experience next to each other. I know with my mm -hmm. now 11-year-old, it's very rare, it's very hard to do that you both you both appreciate it and not for exactly the same reason. And that's what we were hoping to well, what's, do. What happen, when the show is really cracking, what's great is you get the sort of waves of laughter from different sections of the audience. And uh, it's, it's just great. That's yeah, coming it's from fun. all areas. Janine and I sat behind this older woman and this eight-year-old girl in Seattle, and just watching the pair of them right in front of us enjoy the show. Helmet hair. Helmet hair. <laughs> she turned her husband. <laughs> it's just a magical thing that happens when you have a show that can appeal to that 80-year-old and the eight-year-old. And now I sound and, like a marketing campaign. But and the boys wonderful. and the girls uh, yeah. and the men and the <laughs> women. It's, it's very inclusive. I mean, the whole. You know, the, it runs the whole gamut in terms of it has something for everybody, literally. That's a, a beautiful thing, though, I have to say, you know, marketing campaign or not. I, I just had done Carolina or Change. It's a very, very specific, it's very close to my heart. It's a very, very specific piece. I mean, they just did it in Chicago, and the 30 people from the Obama campaign were there. It's specific, in a, in a sense, and wild. And so to open up for an audience like this has has really been also a wonderful e experience so that groups of people can, en can enjoy it. It doesn't exclude people, which is unusual as a project for me. Is it hard to strike that balance at all between the adult humor and the kitty humor? I mean, how do you decide how much burping and flatulence <laughs> to put in? Well, it's always interesting to me what people assign as kitty and adult humor. Sometimes adult humor is something that you might not literally know because of knowledge, but I think the adults laugh at sometimes despite themselves as much as some of those things, Pratt falls, and some of those things that I think are funny to younger people because there's something inherently deep funny about somebody falling down, if, if it's done right, I suppose. But I think <laughs> spit takes. It's big takes. Come on, you know. There's some of those classic things that, that that and I think that you know we did a lot of what made us laugh, and that was a good place to start. And we did the test with with their children, which is always very helpful to know if it was funny. But I also in the final kind of like balancing of what we're talking about when we were watching the audience was to to kind of look at the again, to use your terms, kitty and adult humor to make sure that there was a balance to, that we were keeping, as you always want to do, keep um, your, as much of your audience engaged as you can as you go. So in the final balance, I think that's where we really started to ask, is it too much or too little in those cases? Mm -hmm. So what kind of feedback did your kids offer? Any criticism or was it all positive? Well, you know when they're kicking the chair that it's bad <laughs> news. Yeah. Yes. 
kick in the chair. <clears throat> we had a ballad at the near the end of the show that yeah, and all you heard was that Fiona sang. It was a beautiful song, and Sutton performed it beautifully. But Nicholas was losing his mind. Yeah. Nicholas is my son, and he was just like, "Get me out of here!" <laughs> I was like, "You know what? It's the end of the show. They, he does not have the patience for that three and a half beautiful song sung by a princess." And there were many moments like that where they just tell you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think. I mean, they love it, and uh, they're. At, at what point Sienna, um, our daughter, came, and she, I had to tell her nothing about what's going on, and she leaned over and she said, "Mom, that's a great cut." <laughs> yeah, that's a great cut. The theater kid. It's a funny element in our show that kind of bridges this gap, I think, in, for me in my process, was is that we have puppets in the show. And because puppets, a lot of people consider it as sort of a kiddie thing. And you know, a lot of the adults were doubters, but there was one time in particular, I remember Nicholas laughed at the puppets and I breathed a sigh of relief because right. I thought, and we also, and the audience laughs at them. And there's something, again, there's something inherently, I think, delightful, theatrical, um, magical about what puppets can do, and so it appeals to you know different people in different ways. But the puppets in particular, whether it's puppet ears, puppet legs, you know the other puppets in the show that that kind of bridge that gap between kitty and adult in a really yeah. surprising way. But it's universal. Show. I mean, I think yeah. that something's happened where there's been this division of kitty and adult, and, yeah. and I'm not sure I like the word kitty. Yeah. As a parent, it makes me a little I don't know icky. But you know the tradition of Ernie Kovacs and Jackie Gleason and and the Nairobi Trio and all of that stuff and Harpo Marx. I mean those guys, the spit takes and the stuff that all the great old cartoons. I mean yeah. the great ones where they had the orchestra and the, the Bugs Bunny and as if those were funny and they're still there's there's something Topo Gijo. I mm -hmm. remember watching with my dad. and We both laughed because it's little mm -hmm. and there's there's something really wonderful about about that and I not I don't know if it's been lately that it's split off in a way. I, I I also think if you make something for kids, you kinda make it for no one, to be honest with you. I think if you aim for kids, you actually end up aiming much your where your hit is much lower than that. I mean I don't even <coughs> really think we had the adult versus kid conversation until the audience was there. Yeah. And it was more, oh well wow, the kids right. love that, the adults love that. Like we we weren't in the creation of it, ever dividing yeah, it up true. into different buckets, mm, like we, we just were. Okay, that's a funny joke for the story, and that's a funny joke for the story, and that guy falling down over there, that's really good, and those two interacting that way, that's really funny and good for those characters. That's how they would behave in the story right now, and so because it's Shrek and because it's fairy tales, I think you get that's the currency that we're trading in. So you get a lot of those things because of it, but I think really only when the audience was there do we start to really analyze it from. Oh, that's a the kids love that joke, or the adults love that joke. But really, what these guys said before, it's it's two people sitting next to each other, vastly different backgrounds or ages, having a great time together is what I think you get You get that when you have that stuff butted up next to each other. The same about emotion and comedy. I was going to mm -hmm. say, you're, yeah. you're looking for universal comedy, you're also yeah. looking for a universal theme. Mm -hmm. And so that, you know, try and get those things to be together. That's what, that's what theater should be doing, is uniting people in those, in those ideas. Was the out of town tryout pretty helpful? That's what oh, we're for. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, it was <laughs> incredibly helpful. Yes, it was helpful. Uh, it was helpful. <laughs> it was more than helpful. It was, yeah, we couldn't have done it without it. And in fact, just Seattle, you know, I think we actually, with this team and this group of actors, we knew we were going to want to be making changes right up until the end. And in fact, we have. And I think that we were able to use the out of town to its best advantage, but also the preview process, with listening. I mean, we, we all have a certain perfectionist quality about us and keep trying to get it right. And in, in this particular show, there is kind of a mark you're trying to hit in some ways, too, because you know what, the, what excites you about the story that you want to communicate to other people. So if one song isn't communicating it, maybe another song needs to. And so, you know, we've been making changes right up until the end because I think that's, that's and when you have that audience element, like you say, only then can you truly know if you're communicating the story that you want to. What were some of the things you saw, for example, that didn't work, that you thought, okay, we have to change this, we have to tweak this, from your perspective? So many, so many things. I think, you know, we were trying to create a fairy tale, or trying to create a fairy tale world, and so to make the world seem cohesive was, it was a big question. I think we, our dragon was always a big something that we've worked on because the Dave and Jean gave voice to the dragon who doesn't speak in the in, doesn't speak in the film so figuring out how to um, render her that she's changed a lot since we've moved from Seattle 
um, also in this production, we had a lot of technical elements that we were basically trying out some new ideas, turntables, live animation, and things that we could only really see how they worked once we got them. And so that it became a little bit of our tech workshop there as well. But ultimately, again, all of that aside, you're looking to see is the audience, is the audience listening? Is the audience listening? Where are they bored? Where are they laughing? Whose idea was the live animation? Well, Bill, Bill told me about the live animation that DreamWorks had developed for other uses, where they were going to use it on the Olympics or the Oscars or something. Yeah. And it, it had never been fully developed. And we were talking, it seemed like an exciting idea and something that had never been done on stage before. And it could be, in fact, live. So there was sort of the character of the magic mirror seemed to, a way to apply that. And I think we weren't sure if that was going to work right up until the end again, because it was developed um, for this and for that actor. And um, I think it's, it's something brand new. Maybe somebody will yeah. use it in the theater again. I hope so. It's the first time it's ever been done. Um, it's, a <clears throat> it's, it's a performance capture thing that live renders the actor's performance into essentially a digital puppet. Um, and we had tried to do that with, you know, so that you could have a character from a movie that, you know, host the a show or be on the Super Bowl or something, but could never get it to work that way. So we just hunkered down. I mean, we we started. You wanted it originally thought it would be pre-tape kind of animation, mm -hmm. and I personally always have an issue with that when I go to the theater. I know something is taped. It always makes me just a little it. bit crazy. So <clears throat> I, I was like, oh, we should we should try to do something first time with this and try and crack it. And I think really the reason we were able to crack it on the production was because the magic mirror model itself, the look of the mirror is actually quite simple. And so the data points from you know your face, how they register to the mirror actually made a great translation. And, um, and so yeah, the, the, uh, the, dream, the, the engineers at DreamWorks and then a company called Autodesk came together to figure this out. And boy, they really. It's an amazing thing. I mean, amazing. it's literally an actor with um, a face covered in, I'm not sure even what they're called, but they're Dots. these extraordinary <laughs> dot things that, that actually then read through a computer and create a live performance. And, it, and it's palpable in the theatre. I mean, as Bill says, the magic mirror is a person. And it's a fantastic moment when it's clear that that is an actor speaking and reacting to the actors on stage. It's like with all, it, like you say, it's a sophisticated puppet, but it's not, it's not theatrical or successful unless it has humanity behind it. So the fact that it's able to, I hope, render that humanity just like any puppet would it be expressive is part of what makes it emotional to watch. And it's also using the high school test, something that you don't need a computer yeah. or anything. We also this talked about do doing the magic mirror and with a friend. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's what we, we considered that as well. Can, yeah. Yeah. What level of the production mm -hmm. are we going to take it to? Absolutely. So how many new songs did you guys write while you were out there? That are in? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how many we wrote. Yeah, yeah, two answers. We, in the course of doing the show, we wrote 50 songs that are not in the show. Really? Mm -hmm. No. 50 yeah. so all told, right? I don't know. I lost uh, count. I think by, yeah, maybe all told. Because we're giving them as opening the night gifts. <laughs> <laughs> out in Seattle, we probably wrote four or five songs, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah, for sure. In Seattle, yeah. We tend to write and then quickly. a couple more. And then two more since mm. we started here? Yeah. Right? yeah. Mm -hmm. A lot. Is that difficult to, to be sort of under the gun, like you have to produce a new song in a certain number of days? Or? I think so. It, no. I mean, Not if we really need a new song, sometimes the moment is so clear what it's supposed to be yeah. that writing the song becomes easier. I mean, there was yeah, so, I yeah. mean, the one song that we wrote literally overnight in Seattle um, is a sunflower song where Shrek uh, is going to confess his love to Fiona. It was actually Bill's suggestion. He said, you know, what if we had that moment right before where Shrek was full of hope? And the moment was so clear that we knew exactly what it needed to be. And I wrote a lyric and handed it to Janine, and literally two hours later she came out with the rest of the song. I taught it to Brian. It was in the next night. Well, he learned it right then, yeah. and it was orchestrated. It's much harder to write when you're not exactly sure what the moment is, when you're stabbing in the dark. It's like, is it this? Is it that? It, right. Trying to find the moment is, is much, much harder. Mm -hmm. um, but for, the, for these songs that happened quickly, it wasn't that hard, actually. David and I work really well under pressure. I, I need pressure to work. It's strange. I don't. If I'm left to my own devices, I would eat you know, Butterfingers and watch mm -hmm. Bravo all, literally all day. <laughs> so if I don't have that fear, uh, you know, I think it would be a different candy for you. But 
motivation by deadline is, I don't know, do you feel that way? You, you seem to write a lot without I don't that. need deadlines, no. Deadlines Ooh. terrify me, we're different. <laughs> <laughs> oh, all right. Well, anyway, I would be alone in my... <laughs> <laughs> I need better. My glucose stupor <laughs> then. Yeah. But what candy would you eat? Milky <laughs> Way, <laughs> Milky Way, no <laughs> doubt. That I know. Milky Way. Milky Way Butterfingers, okay. See, this is, this is the real information. <laughs> <laughs> How a musical gets made. Everyone wants to know. Uh, well, how about musical styles? How, how did you decide on one? I mean, I, you talked about Carolina Change, a very different piece, very serious, very heavy, and a very specific musical style. How did you go into a different mindset for this? Uh, every piece that I, I do, um, I do to, based on what I don't know because I, it's just the way that I, I really, um, I, I love to work, I love to work with new people on something that I haven't done before. And uh, this, this to me was inspired by the, the needle drop score. And in that I mean that the songs themselves, which are chosen for lots of different reasons, and it had Leonard Cohen and Smash Mouth, which was based on a Neil Diamond song, which was covered by the Monkees first. It was, there was a universe of music along with it. Um, the, the, the great song that has the Celtic feel to it, the score that has a great, those great themes, you know, 90 pieces and a sound stage. And it's a lot, but it was tied in together somehow, I think, by characters. And that's the approach that we both took, and I think that the team took, is that it's, the story comes out of the mud, so there's, a, there's that quality to it. And, uh, so you have to have that that sound, but when you have Farquaad and Duloc, there's a there's a patina there. There's a kind of thing. It works really well in musical theater, which is about jazz hand, and that thing that he's trying to sell, 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 and the adventure quality, um, the world that all these people are coming from, that are united in one theme, which is basically to thine own self be true, to thine own self be green, whatever it is. And, and, and therefore really inclusive. That's the challenge of it is how not to, the, how the songs don't polarize or pull apart or feel like they're taken from a lot of different sources as opposed to they're expressed in a lot of different ways. And my background is very eclectic and very odd. A lot of you know, pop and rock, a lot of classical opera, strange st things and it's just in this bar mitzvah in my brain and so I, I you know, I, I love, in a show like this, you're able to use uh, the all parts of the engine. And because David has a very eclectic background as well, he listens to the Eels and this and that, all of these bands, it was really easy to say, remember that song? Remember how they used, you know, just this Celtic feel? And so that's basic. we were just ha kind of, you know, playing, a lot of playing around. There was also such a specificity to the character that, um, Janine just sort of zeroed in on what was unique about each of those characters. I mean, obviously Farquaad has, has a formality about him, and you know Shrek uh, has an earthiness about him, and Fiona has a duality about her, and Donkey, there's a hipness to him. That already you had seeds in these characters that, um, that Janine could bring to life in a musical way and with the same specificity. And the movie did, you and know, music, that yeah. Ed, Eddie Murphy sang, you know, here and there, and he, you gotta have friends, and at the end he would sing, but the themes themselves were extraordinary. The underscoring led you there. And so I think that the template, in a way, was set by the movie as well, to look to it and, and go off on our own direction, as, as Bill and Jeffrey were, had said from day one. And this was your first time writing lyrics for a musical. Mm -hmm. So how was that? I, the last musical you did, High Fidelity, you were just doing the book. Mm -hmm. um, so how was this, how was this different? What made you say, okay, I want to write the lyrics too? Um, well, I love saying yes to things I've never done before. <laughs> <laughs> There's that. Um, <clears throat> Uh, there was also just the joy of actually dramatizing the event of a scene. You know, as a playwright, I get to do that all the time. On High Fidelity, uh, it was a great collaboration, but I was constantly handing over the meat of the scene to, to other people, say, okay, you guys go do the fun stuff. <laughs> um, I've always been obsessed with words and word games, and 
the idea of, of going to lyrics was something I've, I was always drawn to. It was actually Janine's idea. You know, when I was first hired, I was just the book writer, and we found ourselves in need of a lyricist. And Janine uh, had a history of working with first-time lyricists who happened to be playwrights. And so Janine said, do you have any interest in writing the lyrics? And I said, well, let's give it a go. And you know, we wrote those first two songs, which were the Dragon Song and the Princess Song. And DreamWorks and Sam and Caro and Jason very bravely said, OK, let's give this a go. Um, but I, I loved it. Uh, I, I don't know that I would write a musical again without doing the lyrics. It's, it's just so part of it's whole. It's it's all of a whole to me now. Mm -hmm. Do you guys sit in the room together when you write? Um, we sit in a room for a long time and talk nonstop about what we think the moment of a song might be, um, and then we go away and work separately and then come back together. Um, there's not a set way of music first or lyrics first. It's really whoever has a stronger impulse. Um, and when lyrics do come first, I will bring it to Janine and often Jason as well and say, what is this? And we get in there and we tear it apart and we say, well, this is good, but what if we move this here? Or what if the hook is here? And it really is the essence of collaboration. And the song gets batted back and forth many, many times, getting sharper and cleaner. And whether it ends up in the show or not you know, remains to be seen. But um, it's a long process writing a song. It's never, here's a lyric, now set it and put it in, other than that Sunflower song. Um, it's just not how it works. Well, we round table a lot. We bring it to Jason a lot. We would decide that it was worth listening to, and then usually it would go then to Jason, who would, you know, directing a new piece is, it's, it's easy to be, uh, you know, a, I guess what they call it, a Tuesday morning quarterback. But directing a new thing it's Monday, is... Monday, I think, actually, isn't it? <laughs> no, but isn't it like the night after, the morning after oh, the Monday yeah. night game? It's a Monday morning quarterback, isn't it? Did we mention no, theater people? No, it's Monday people? night football. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's Monday yeah, night bad. football. Anyway, <laughs> after the fact. That's what <laughs> Can we get a uh, fact checker? <laughs> Can we get someone to check this? Check that fact. It's Monday morning We're critic. All, um, <laughs> You know, it, it's not been done before. So it's it's when I, I watch certain pieces being done on the second go round, and there is this hoopla about oh they really got it this time. It's like try doing it the first time. Mm -hmm. It's really hard in the in the heat of battle. You know, mm -hmm. we'd bring Jason songs, and he would also say what dot 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 uh, when we were doing the duet, which is essentially a love duet for Fiona and Shrek. And it's not about bodily functions. It becomes a a do a duel, in a way, for the duet. But that started because Jason said, you know, we don't have a song for them that has a lot of language in it. And I was listening to this one, and this one, and this one, and we don't have a song like that. And I thought, oh, he's right. And then I got, got very competitive, <laughs> which I kind of am. And, and we set about doing something that was, you know, what they would call a music declamatory, declamatory which means that there's a lot of one note per word, da 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 like a patter is declamatory. And so they wanted to use these two people. What do they have to say to each other if they use words as bullets, or they put their armor out, or they try to reduce each other? What happens is they reduce each other to what they have most in common. I missed my prom. My dad and mom sent me away. It was my birthday. I was sent away on Christmas Eve. Was an intersection of all of those things. I, all those things together. What, we need them to fall in love, knowing that David's strength as a writer could using all that language could be really exciting. Also, knowing that we wanted to have some comedy there, and um, and uh, you know all those things came together to be, you know, this is what we need right that moment in the show, and that's when you guys were able to come back with something so specific. Um, like as, as you say, when the moment is clear, once you start to clear everything away and cut everything oh. away, the heart of it became very clear and your idea to, to have that be the way time, they fall remember? We wanted them to sing long. together. That was post-workshop. Right. And that was, we wanted them to sing together. Right, because Bill kept saying, our leads don't sing yeah. together. Our leads don't sing together. And we're like, how are we going to get them to sing together? And, and it was, I think, I remember you guys you know, saying, well, what, you know, people who sing together generally have something in common to yeah. say at the same time. And so that was, I think, the big discovery was the thing that they both shared was their, you know, their, their family their parent issues that they wanted to, you know, bring out in this particular moment. So, uh, 
But it was also an obstacle. That yeah. that spot was mm, uh, one of obstacle. the was a, a very tricky spot because in the movie again it's a montage and there are no montages in that I know of yet. Maybe someday there will be that solving it by a, a, a montage which just cuts cut 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 cut. There's no cutting an impresinium. And, and and then at at one point there were the merry men. So they had a huge obstacle that then brought them together. And then what, at one point we had something that they would they would go against a band of Trolls? Yes. <laughs> that the trolley was very stroll. Brief. The trolley stroll. <laughs> that, that was very brief. <clears throat> and but with no we didn't realize yeah. that the obstacles were each other. Right. And that they, we didn't need men on the stage to swoop down with bows and arrows. They were battling one another. And then that reduced them. And that just that took three years to figure out. It was out. a long way around. Yeah. So as far as directing, this is a pretty big show. A it little is a big show. Bigger this production is a big show. A little bigger than your last musical, Avenue mm -hmm. Q. Um, intimidating at all? Yeah, I think it, uh, intimidating and exciting and challenging because knowing that the resources of this incredible story and the resources to you know of, of a Broadway show, which is of, of a certain size. But I think the thing that was most intimidating, if you will, is to create a whole new world. That's essentially what it is, is how do all of these crazy characters inhabit the same place. And our four leads were going to be an ogre, a donkey, a princess, and a guy who was really short. And so there's a human element to it. It's not like it's all set in, you know, underwater or all set in the outback or whatever. It's, it's very how to get them all to come together. Um, and we also knew that we wanted to do some exciting things because it's a magical place. There's magic. There are witches and spells, and so there should be some magic. And so that was kind of the impetus to try and ask what are some new things that we could do on stage that are based, you know, based to support the story, but also hopefully are, are exciting to watch. But yeah, it's a it's a big show to tame. But the reason it's a big show to tame is to make the the bigness of it always come back to these three characters walking in the woods because that's really the heart of the story. Was it ever difficult to kind of harness all these resources, especially the sets and the costumes? I mean, there's, like you said, there's not a lot of technically difficult or flashy things, but there's just a lot up there and it's mm -hmm. a really big cast. Yeah, to harness live animation and puppets and turntables and lighting and different kinds of actors and children. Yes, to get them all to be in the same play is definitely one of the biggest challenges, I think, of this particular show and production. But again, if you, I, I always feel like if you always bring it back to the basics of the story and make sure something isn't getting in the way of that, when you have good material to start with, that that hopefully brings everything together. That's the gel around it. There actually are many, many tricky technical things up there. The fact that you don't know that or think that there aren't is how well they have been harnessed. Mm -hmm. I, I think it is, you know, from a technology and from a first time ever standpoint, there's so many things up there that have never been done before, but ultimately it's a human organic world and so none of those things can, need to, or should mm -hmm. be evident to the audience because it's a, it has to be holistic and complete yeah. and so, um, so yeah, yeah, I always think that the audience doesn't care that there are three turntables there yeah. and all this you know, technology to make them move, but what hopefully they feel is that when they move, it's magic, and that creates something that's a tone in the world, and that, again, hopefully it seems simple, even though it's not always. What are some of the technical difficult things that besides the mirror, which there's we talked about? The mirror, turntables. there's three interlocking turntables, there's right. um, mini computerized sliders, there's um, a large large puppet. Um, they're <laughs> small puppets, but I also, also call this show, it's like high-tech, low-tech, because we have these big crazy turntables, but also um, our Farquad has these two little stuffed felt legs that he manipulates, and that's, I think, the charm of it, is that it can kind of do both. It can have big, maybe big production value, but also, again, at the heart of it, it's, it's two people with puppet legs making some funny faces, and that gets back to some basic kind of humor. Shrek's makeup. Shrek's makeup, prosthetics like that have never really been done before on Broadway. It takes it takes a lot of again craft to blur the edge between Brian's face and where the prosthetic is, and if it's hopefully feels simple and elegant. But yeah, a lot of makeup, a lot of makeup on the show, a lot of fat padding, a lot of uh, ice packs that race car drivers wear to keep their bodies cool. There's some also just some sort of sort of basic housekeeping things that you have to figure out where to put all that stuff and and keep the actors comfortable so they can keep giving that performance underneath all that. 
So what kind of feedback as producers did you guys offer or were you comfortable offering or did you just feel free relentless to feedback. <laughs> <laughs> so whatever you want to say very comfortable offering relentless feedback <laughs> <laughs> well it's, on any musical it's incredibly to have an actual creative insightful producer because you spend so much time with moments and eventually you have to there's another layer of feedback and i think the best theater producers do do that they give really good creative character feedback that makes the show better and amazing support, sorry, but from the rest of the team, like, you know, the production designers and, and uh, the producers, uh, the people that produced the movie with Bill and Jeffrey, Aaron Warner, and mm -hmm. the way they've wrapped around and they've been so supportive and helpful. That, that's been, it's been very collaborative from that point of view. Yeah, there was no line between producers and collaborators, in a, in a good way. I mean, as maddening as collaboration can be, and it can be maddening and horrible, and we can get very angry at each other. Um, it, it was also as invaluable as it was maddening, and there's not a thing in in the show that we all didn't have a piece of. We were all right, and we were all wrong in different moments, and that includes Bill yeah. and Jeffrey and yeah. every one of us. That we are all very much part of a team, and the show is what it is because of every single person, and not just because Jason and Janine and I did it. Mm -hmm. Bill is as in that show as any of us are, and Caro as well. We're all in it together, for better or for worse. <laughs> So it never felt like a too many cooks in the kitchen. Oh, it always feels like too many cooks. And a musical is always lots. And a musical, cooks. it's committee. It has to be committee. That's what you sign up for. Otherwise, you really should write a novel. I mean, <laughs> or you know, play. Or play. <laughs> but ultimately, I mean, I think the other thing is that you know, it's like you know, discussions are discussions and notes are notes. Like that's like a certain mm -hmm. point. Then there, there's just this giant wall or cliff that you fall off of because ultimately, these guys have to go away and do it and do the work and and know it and love it and come back with something they believe in and so. You can, you can collaborate or talk as much as you want, but ultimately the best stuff in the show is stuff that they believe in with their full hearts. And so, you know, the, and, I, and I think that sometimes what the collaboration does or what the notes do is they actually talk, they point you more towards what doesn't work mm -hmm. in a strange way. It's yeah, like, great, right. cross That's a big true. black mm -hmm, X mm -hmm. on that. We're not doing that. That does not work. And so I think, you know, some moments you, you guys arrived at it because you knew exactly what it needed to be from the very first moment. Other moments you arrived at through a process of elimination, and I think that's where, um, you know, I think that's where the team is very focused, is like, we just want it to be good. You know, we want every moment to be really, really, really good, and that's kind of, even when we're not agreeing about stuff, it's all about making the show good, not getting what we want or serving some other agenda. It was all like, the show just has to be great. There's an art to taking a note which is sometimes taking the note means not taking the note. And that means considering the note and thinking, I'm not gonna take it like I'm getting you a sandwich and if you want it on ham, ham on rye, I'm gonna consider the note and does it apply? Do I really think it's correct? I, there's something about it, let's, con and going, at, or you, you end up with a big mishmash written by a lot of people as opposed to, he's right, it's, it's written by two people but with the influence of many, mm -hmm. and that ability to hold strong, and you have to be strong-willed. So now this is DreamWorks' first foray into Broadway. Was that intimidating at all? Did you feel pressure from the studio side? Like, boy, I better get this right. Uh, yeah, yeah, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, because it's, um, I guess now with with a, a little bit of perspective, you could say like, yeah, okay, let's take you know one of the most beloved films ever, the first animated film ever to win an Academy Award, one of the biggest film franchises ever in the history of film, <laughs> and we're going to go make a musical out of it, and um, and and, yeah, and we're going to hire you know, the guy who wrote Rabbit Hole and the woman who wrote Carolina Change. <laughs> and it's going to be great, I swear, I promise. <laughs> Was that your pitch? <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, I, no, nobody, and it, that, that wasn't the exact pitch, but every now and then someone would be like, really, really? Like that was like kind of like how it was adding up. It's like, yeah, no, yeah, it's going to be amazing. It's going to be really amazing. So um, yeah, I think, I think it, because it was, because it's Shrek, I mean, we haven't really said that even here. It's like, because it's Shrek, you, you kind of, uh, that burden is huge. You know, mm -hmm. there's a big burden there. Mm -hmm. um, I think for the most part, we did a pretty good job of trying to keep that outside of the room because that and alone will, will make you crazy. Um, and, um, but 
but yeah, it was. I think there was pressure, pressure, because I think in theater you really you get one shot. You know, you make a good version of your show or you make a not good version. And if you make a good version, it can last forever and people will love it. And if you make the not good version, it's the not good version. So, you know, that I think there's a lot of uh, the time that we spent to, to do it and the care that we all put into it and the collaboration was a direct response to, let's make a good version. There are a lot of Broadway references in the, in the show. Was that purposeful? It wasn't actually purposeful. We talked about it and said, oh, we weren't, we're not going to do that. Why would we do that? And then these organic moments just came out of the storytelling and said, well, should we do that? And it was just, it, it really is just a handful of little moments. It and started, the way that they too, are. The, the with um, Chris, right? At the end, we were just joking around. Oh, Chris Sieber, right. The Farquaad moment is from. Right, what well, we won't say, but. It's from another show that's referenced. But, but we just, I don't even remember how that came about. We just thought it was funny. Yeah. And so we stuck it in and it stayed, and then a couple other moments went in. You know, so the movie does it as well, it references other things. It doesn't build the story upon it, and we don't as well. It's just funny little jokes. You, you land them and you get out of there. That's what, we're, that's what we did. But we didn't go in with that idea. Not at all. It just yeah. happened. Well, we'll leave them for the audiences to discover. We don't want to give away too many of them. Well, this has been great. I'm, it's such a rare treat to have the whole team behind a show discussing it. And, uh, and you guys have been great. Thanks. Thanks for having us. Thank, thank you. It's been great. Thank you for joining us. These programs are brought to you from the Graduate Center of the City University in New York in partnership with our friends at CUNY TV. On behalf of the American Theatre Wing, I'm Melissa Rose Bernardo, and thanks for joining us for another edition of Working in the Theatre. I'm Ted Chapin, Chairman of the American Theatre Wing. The Wing has played a vital role in New York's theatrical life for more than 60 years. Best known for creating the Tony Awards, we stand for excellence, but we also support education in the theatre, and our work reaches beyond Broadway in New York. The Working in the Theatre television programs which are supported by the Annenberg Foundation and the Dorothy Strelson Foundation, are unequaled forums for discussions with today's most creative artists. Downstage Center's in-depth radio interviews were created in conjunction with XM Satellite Radio and can be heard on our website. Our annual theater company grants support New York not-for-profits and since they began have distributed nearly $3 million. We are also pleased to be the home of the Jonathan Larson grants which support emerging composers and lyricists. For people who are starting their careers, we have a two-week boot camp for aspiring actors from colleges across the country called Springboard NYC. And our theater intern group provides a forum for young people who are starting their careers to build a professional network. All of the American Theater Wing's educational and media programs are available for free on demand from our website, americantheaterwing.org. Thanks for your interest in the wing, and thanks for watching.